The West is big, and on Utah's Grand Circle Tour, you're going to see quite a bit of it, including its mighty five national parks. It's a route through some of the most spectacular and well-known landscapes in the world. When you think of the West, you probably think of the iconic buttes of Monument Valley, or the improbably cartoonish red rock near Moab, or snow-capped mountains. It's a place where you're often reminded that this land once belonged to others. We'll drive well over a thousand miles through incredible landscapes, and we'll even do a little exploring off the main highway. We'll experience all sorts of Mother Nature's weather, as well as her sense of humor. You may even be inspired by her power. We'll see firsthand how the elements and time constantly transform the land. We'll visit eight national parks, some state parks, national monuments, and one tribal park. We'll spend much of our time near the Four Corners, where the states of New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona all meet. It's also a place where cultures meet. This is the hub of the Western Native American nations. The first Europeans came through here just 500 years ago, and they're still coming. About two-thirds of today's visitors are from Europe, and a significant number of others come from Asia. I'm going to show you more than just amazing places. My goal is to encourage you to come out here yourself. So I'll provide information to help you better appreciate and to get the most out of your trip. When you come all this way, you're going to want to bring back some great pictures. And I'll show you where and how to get some great shots. And I'll tell you when to be there to get the best light. This travel guide is divided into segments that were written to stand on their own. So if you get bored with, say, all the geological info or the photo how-to section, just skip ahead a bit. I'll also encourage you to look at the local tourism websites for more information. The images in this travel guide were taken on several trips to the area with various weather conditions. At some locations, the weather never did cooperate. And I'll show you that footage too. It's a reminder that the uncontrollable mother nature is always in charge. You can start your trip at any point along the Grand Circle. International airports near the route are in Phoenix, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas. Durango's small airport is only 200 miles to the east of Monument Valley. And Monument Valley is closest to my base, so that's where we're going to begin. It's great out here, and I hope my images and words do it justice, and that they encourage you to come out here and see it for yourself. Arguably the most recognized place in the West is Monument Valley. This magnificent area was largely unknown outside the Navajo Nation until the 1930s, when Harry Goulding, the owner of the only hotel around, sent photos of the landscape near his hotel to Hollywood director John Ford. The images intrigued Ford. He ended up shooting several Westerns here, and soon, to people around the world, this defined the American West. Later, parts of the Back to the Future movies were shot here. Later still, this is where Forrest Gump stopped running across the country. It's on semi-autonomous land under Navajo Nation jurisdiction. So Monument Valley is a Navajo Nation tribal park. It straddles the Arizona-Utah border. The park road turnoff is in Utah, but it quickly heads south back into Arizona. And like most parks, there is an entry fee. You'll spend many hours on the road just to get here. The nearest major airport is in Phoenix, over 300 miles away. Perhaps because it is so remote, few Americans come here. Almost all of the visitors are from Europe or the Far East. A surprising number get here on Harleys. It's pretty easy to take a photo worth hanging on your wall here. At the end of this video, I'll show you where some of the best photo opportunities are. While this view from the parking lot is really good, there's a better way to see this American icon. If your vehicle is up to it, you can drive through the valley for free. A 17-mile dirt road winds its way through the valley. Many of the overseas visitors get here on a tour bus that's too large for the road. So there is another option. For $40 to $75 each, you can take a guided tour in an open vehicle. Well, it's almost always hot and dusty on the approximately two-hour tour so your own vehicle is likely to be the more comfortable choice. 
It's plenty wide and safe for most vehicles. Only large RVs and cars with very low ground clearance are not recommended. The view out the windscreen is always great, but the visitor's guide lists 11 viewpoints that are really special. The first is a view of the mittens from a slightly lower vantage point. They look a bit like hands, and hence the name, but they signify spiritual beings. The road continues to drop to the valley floor. The speed limit is 15 miles an hour, so there's plenty of time to see the sights. The next viewpoint is Elephant Butte. It's the large feature just ahead. They say with the right lighting, there's a resemblance to an elephant facing west. Like most of the landmarks in the valley, it does not have a Navajo name. Most were named by early settlers. It's quite easy to identify the next view. Those three spires in the distance are the Three Sisters. They represent a Catholic nun facing her two pupils. The road gets a bit sandy as it heads to one of the best known views in the valley. It was named after the man who made it famous, director John Ford. This view can be seen in many classic movies, including the 1956 classic, The Searchers, with John Wayne. In one scene, you can see this spot before the road was built. There's a large parking area here and locals are allowed to sell their handiwork in small shacks and on tables. For a couple of dollars, a man on a horse will even pose for you, so you can get that perfect shot. Viewpoint number five, Camel Butte, is the mesa on the right. After John Ford's point, the trail is a narrow one-way track that is pretty flat. View number six is Rain God Mesa. It's on the left. It marks the geological center of the park. It's named for the rain god, who stored water for the people on the south side of the mesa. Seven is Sandy Springs Aquifers. I didn't see a spring, but there is plenty of sand in front of view number eight, the totem pole. Just to the left of the totem pole is one of the few features with a Navajo name. I can't pronounce it. It's something like Yi Bi Chi. The totem pole is one of the most photographed locations in the tribal park. To get up close, you'll have to hire a guide with a 4x4. From here, the road starts its return leg. It's a bit narrow and sandy. The winding path goes through some quite interesting scenery, including this balanced rock. After a slight incline, there's a large parking area for Artist Point, which is viewpoint number 9. As the light changes throughout the day, the scene also changes here, and some hang out here all day. There are only two viewpoints left. The window can be seen from the road, but there's a better view of the mitten between the two buttes at the end of a short walking trail. The last viewpoint is called the thumb. Shortly after the thumb, the path joins the main two-way road back to the parking lot. Though you've been on this section before, you'll be amazed at how different it looks heading in the opposite direction. So, take your time. On average, it takes one and a half to two and a half hours to complete the 17 mile loop. The average visitor stays only for a few hours, but to really see the place, you'll have to stay for at least a couple of days. Up until a few years ago, there was nothing on site but a small diner. Gouldings was the only hotel within 20 miles, and jobs for the locals were hard to come by. But in 2008, the Navajo opened the View Hotel. It has nice rooms for about $220 a night. There's also a new restaurant, gift shop, and small museum. If you've been here before, you may remember the $10 per night campground. Well, that's long gone. It's been replaced by cabins that cost at least $200 a night. There's a new RV park on the main road, just to the north. Gouldings is four miles down the road. Rooms there are about $200 to $250 a night. There are many moderately priced hotels 20 plus miles to the south in the town of Cayenta, Arizona. If you stay there, believe it or not, you need to go to the Burger King to see a museum quality display describing the role of the Navajo wind talkers in World War II. I sometimes stay a few minutes further up the road in the small town of Mexican Hat. It has a couple of hotels and restaurants, a gas station, and a motel. 
here for $35, 38 if you're paying by credit card. You'll get a room at the Canyonlands Motel with no air conditioning, but it will have a bath and a plug to power your battery charges into. On my visit, it was full of partying Germans who were smoking and laughing into the wee hours. This caused me to wake up late and just miss the sun rising behind the mittens. But that didn't really matter because while shooting this time-lapse video, a man asked me to show him how to use his camera. Immediately after I did, he walked right into my shot, proving once again that no good deed goes unpunished. Now, here are a few hints on how to photograph this place. I've been here several times, dating back to 1996, and I've been lucky enough to take several good images over the years. But good light makes it much easier. And on one trip, I got nothing. It was in March. They say that's a good time to come. But for me, the sky was overcast for several days. I've had much better luck in May, June, and in the fall. Outside the park boundary, to the north, is where you'll find the classic shot of the road with Sentinel Mesa in the background. It can be taken on Highway 163 near mile marker 13. At one of the smaller turnouts on the northwest side of the road, there's even a small sign designating the spot where the fictional Forrest Gump quit his cross-country run. It's so popular that when the road was repaved, they even added a few parking turnouts to handle the crowds that come from all over the world. This group includes a minibus of Chinese, hipsters from the UK, and a minivan full of Aussies. And when I visit the next time, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if there's a ticket booth and a gift shop here too. The sun lights this side of the mesa in the morning. Here's what it looks like from the other side in the evening. This shot was taken on the main park road, just east of 163. These shots were taken next to the parking lot. By the way, several apps can tell you from which direction and when the sun will rise any day of the year. I use the iPhone app called Helios, but to get the shot, you'll have to get here plenty early, and you'll have to talk people out of walking into your shot, which is especially hard when they don't speak your language. The visitor center patio is a great place to watch the shadows move across the valley and up the buttes as the sun sinks below the horizon. To get some greenery in your shots of the mittens, drive down to the first pullout. The three sisters are backlit in the evening, as is the thumb. I tend to shoot John Ford's point in the afternoon and evening. And the man on the horse is much more likely to be there during the high summer season. He makes his living a few dollars at a time, posing, so bring a few dollars with you. I also tend to shoot Artist Point in the afternoon and evening, but you can get great stuff here all day. There are plenty of nice shots just about anywhere. All you have to do is look and find them. There are advantages to hiring a guide for a private photo tour. In until recently, you could negotiate with a private guide. I once got a driver for a half a day for $75. Now you have to go through the official office to hire a guide. The fee is fixed by elders at about $300 each. If you have a family, this trip could be very expensive. The quote for a pre-sunrise drive for me and two others to a high nearby overlook on a mesa was $1,300. For this reason, photo group tour leaders have told me, told me that they will not be returning to Monument Valley until this policy changes. But if you want to get up close to the totem, well, you'll need a guide. These shots were taken in late afternoon. To get here, we had to drive through deep sand. The guide also took me to this little arch or window. One of my favorite spots in the valley is only accessible with the aid of a guide. It's called the Teardrop. It takes about 45 minutes to get there. This shot was taken in early afternoon. Well, I hope this section will help you take your own photographic masterpieces in the wonderful Monument Valley. There's plenty more to see in the Four Corners area. Just 40 minutes up the road are a couple of amazing places. This formation gave a little town its name, Mexican Hat. Several dirt roads southeast of 163 are worth exploring. They lead to the back country. Back in the day, this formation was used as a navigation aid. Today, it's just one attraction of this unique area. Another road leads to a small canyon cut by the San Juan River beyond which lies an exposed fault. Geologists come here to decipher Earth's history. Photographers come here to capture the beauty of nearly 1,000 feet of stratified layers bending beneath the river. 
Even the rock here has an interesting story. If you're into geology, you know that the loose, unconsolidated rocks seen here are the remnants of the ancestral Rocky Mountains. That's right, before the current Rocky Mountains. There was another set, hundreds of millions of years ago. The first mountains in this area were as high as the Himalaya. Over time, they eroded away. So the rocks we see here are nothing more than debris. Eventually, the current Rockies will meet the same fate. A couple of hours spent here are spent well. An even better place to see what's left of the long gone mountains is marked by a small sign reading Gooseneck State Park. This is one of the world's finest examples of an entrenched meander. It's rare for a river to make one horseshoe bend, but from this spot, three are visible. The San Juan River cuts through just over a thousand feet of rubble left by the original Rockies. The best way to see them is on a raft. An outfitter in the town of Mexican Hat will drop you off upstream and you'll travel through these canyons. There is little white water, depending on the season, and you can camp on the riverbank. The potential for great photography is obvious, but you need great light for great images. When I got here at mid-afternoon, it was cloudy and the light was bad, but I decided to wait it out. A few drops of rain started to fall, but the sun was still lighting the top of the canyons. I knew what that meant. Something good was about to happen. I just didn't know where it would be. One of the cameras caught a piece of it as the rainbow appeared. It only lasted for a few minutes, and I had to scramble to get some nice video and stills. This is one of those moments when all the hardships, disappointments, bad weather, not to mention the expense of travel, make all the effort worthwhile. But it wasn't easy. I took a few shots with a still camera and then stitched them together into a panorama. This was taken on the second to the last day on an eight-day shoot. We drove over 3,300 miles, and this was only the second sellable image I came home with. You can stay here. There's a paved parking area and a flat dirt area where RVs and tenters can stay for no charge. There's no running water, but there are nice pit toilets. You're actually allowed to pitch a tent anywhere you like. If you're fit enough, you can even scramble your gear down a steep trail to camp on a small plateau 100 or so feet below the viewpoint. Many people talk about getting in touch with nature. The folks down there figured out a way to do it. While Monument Valley is the main draw to this area, those willing to explore will be rewarded. A further 45 miles up the road is Natural Bridges National Monument. It was sleety when I was there, so I didn't venture on the trails. On the way, you can travel through the Valley of the Gods. It's a smaller scale version of Monument Valley. Then you'll climb 1,000 feet up the Moki Dugway to the top of Cedar Mesa. Now it's time to start our next leg of the journey. From the Goosenecks, it's only about 120 miles to the outdoor lover's mecca of Moab. In the next section, we'll tour Arches and Canyonlands National Parks as well as some lesser known gems. No tour of the Grand Circle is complete without spending at least a couple of days in the area around Moab, Utah. This is an outdoor lover's paradise. The world's largest selection of natural stone arches is just a few miles up the road in Arches National Park. A little further up the road are the amazing views of the Island in the Sky District of Canyonlands National Park. But there's more. There's an incredible overlook in Dead Horse Point State Park. There are lazy float trips and multi-day white water trips on the Colorado River. And for those who like heights, there are 500-foot cliffs and the Fisher Towers just waiting to be climbed. Sure, you can drive through the parks, but there are other ways to see the amazing scenery. There are short and long trails for hikers and cyclists. And there are rough high clearance and 4x4 only trails to explore the backcountry. And if you want to exercise your brain, or perhaps your child's brain, there are incredible lessons in geologic and human history. The town of Moab itself is quite a little gem. It seems a lot bigger than other towns of 5,100 people. Whether you're a budget camper or if you prefer accommodations that are as special as the scenery, you can find it all in Moab. There are restaurants of all types, and even a few night spots. If you didn't bring your 4x4, mountain bike, or other gear, you can rent them all here. 
If you have the time, you can easily spend a couple of weeks based in Moab. But since we're doing the Grand Circle, we've only got a couple of days. And we're going to show you how to make the most of them. No Grand Circle tour is complete without spending at least a day in Arches National Park. It's a delightfully colorful place where 100 million years of erosion create ever-changing natural sculptures and architecture. The park is small enough to drive through in a few hours, but it's intriguing enough that some spend a week or two exploring it on foot, on bicycles, and on off-road vehicles in search of adventure in the land of more than 2,000 arches. Because of our limited time, we'll explain how to make the most out of about a day and a half in the park. The entrance is just four miles from the center of town. After paying the National Park entry fee, it's a good idea to stop at the visitor center to learn about the area you're about to explore. The bulk of the park is on a plateau, several hundred feet above the visitor center. The road switches back twice as it climbs the Moab Fault. A sign near the top states that six million years ago, the rock layers on this side of the valley dropped 2,600 feet lower than those on the other side of the valley. Once on the plateau, the park road winds its way north past four to 500 foot sandstone monoliths that were pushed up through the surrounding landscape. The first large pullout is for a place called Park Avenue. The high stone walls reminded early explorers of the famous New York landmark. It's hard to understand just how big everything is until you see someone wandering in the rocks. There is a short trail, but summer temperatures are often in the 90s or higher, so you need to bring plenty of water. From the viewpoint, you get your first look at the different rock in the park. The arches tend to form in the Entrada sandstone. Here it's way up near the top. Throughout the park, you'll see signs stating, don't bust the crust. It's alive. This refers to microorganisms that live in the soil. It takes a hundred years for tiny black bacteria to create enough soil for even the most basic plants. And one step from your boot could kill it. So don't bust the crust. A little further down the road, we come to the LaSalle Mountain viewpoint. Beyond the outcrop are petrified yellowish sand dunes. In the background, to the east, the LaSalles rise 13,000 feet, so snow covers the peaks most of the time. To the north, there's a great view of several more features. These are the three gossips. This is the organ and the Tower of Babel. While we drive to our next stop, I'll try to explain how the landscape got this way. It all started about 300 million years ago, when this tectonic plate was closer to the equator. This land was covered by seawater, so much seawater that 7,900 feet of mostly salt, but also potash and gypsum, accumulated before the sea dried up. For much of the next 100 to 150 million years, hundreds of feet of sand and other soft materials built up on top of the salt, during a time when this region was dry and much like today's Sahara Desert. By this time, the ancestral Rocky Mountains were eroding away, providing plenty of overburdened material which helped turn the ancient desert sand to stone. The weight of the sand and the mountain debris put pressure on the underlying salt layer. Under pressure, salt becomes a semi-fluid. It moves and oozes, kind of like pushing on the center of a tube of toothpaste. Because the weight of the sand and other overburden varied from place to place, in some places the ground sank, and in others it pushed up massive slabs of sandstone, like the one seen here. Starting 100 million years ago, the erosion process began to take over and the tectonic plate began moving north. All this movement caused many vertical cracks that created giant blocks of sandstone. This can be seen quite easily from the air in the Devil's Garden. Over time, the cracks became wider, and with the help of the erosional forces of water, ice, and wind, the tall slabs began to look like the fins we see in the park today. Erosional forces and waterborne chemical reactions further weaken the stone, causing holes to form in the fins. When a hole has a span of at least three feet, it's classified as an arch. This process has occurred at least 2,000 times in the park, and it continues to happen. 
and from time to time, the arches do collapse. That's the end of the lecture, and just in time. We've reached our next stop. It's called Balanced Rock. It's 128 feet tall. There used to be a smaller balanced rock nearby, but it fell over in the 70s. One day, this one will fall over too. A bit further down the road is a turnoff for the window section. Once again, the view out the windscreen is quite good. The road generally goes southeast at this point, so the best light is in the afternoon. With the windows and double arch, this is a very popular area, and it can be difficult to find a parking spot most of the day. After a short walk from the parking lot, there's a fork in the trail. To the right is turret arch. To the left is the windows. The north window is pretty impressive in the evening, but in the morning, if you climb through it, you'll see one of the park's iconic views. That's turret arch as seen through the north window just after sunrise. To get to this spot, well, it requires a bit of a scramble. It's not easy or even very safe. In fact, the man in this shot decided it was too dangerous for him to try to get to this camera position. Once here and after your nerves have settled, you get to appreciate just how big and incredible these formations are. Across the parking lot is another well-known feature, double arch. You may recognize it from a scene in the Indiana Jones movies. With a little effort, you can climb right into it. A further two and a half miles up the road is a spur road to the most famous arch in the park, Delicate Arch. Again, it can be difficult to find a place to park. A small cabin near the trailhead was built by the Wolf family, who settled here in the late 1800s. They managed to eke out a living here for more than 20 years. Delicate Arch is a mile and a half and almost 500 feet up the mostly slick rock trail, which, by the way, isn't slippery. It's more like sandpaper. This is the most recognized view in Utah. It's even on the state license plate. The 63-foot tall arch is at the edge of a large sandstone bowl that has been hollowed out by swirling wind and water. Again, the LaSalle Mountains provide the backdrop. At sunset, this is the perfect place to be. If the main Delicate Arch parking lot is full, there's another way to see the famous arch. Head a mile or so down the road to the lower Delicate Arch trailhead. This trail is less traveled, and you can't get very close to it from here. But it's still amazingly odd to see a large stone arch perched in a bowl on the edge of a sheer cliff. The road next leads to the Fiery Furnace. Here you can take a ranger-led hike, but you have to purchase your tickets in advance to guarantee a spot. Unfortunately, the only video we have of it is from 1995. The trail is much like a maze, and you're not allowed to explore it on your own until after you've completed a ranger-led hike. The hike is only about two miles long, but with all the tight passageways and detailed ranger talks, it takes three to three and a half hours to complete. At one point, you can crawl through a small arch. At another, your feet don't even touch the ground as you press your hands and feet against the sides of two fins to move through a tight section. It's actually about 20 degrees cooler in the fiery furnace than it is in the outside air. So on a hot summer day, this is a cool ticket to have. And it's a great way to spend an afternoon. We're now on our way to the Devil's Garden. On the way, you may want to stop at Skyline Arch. It's one of the biggest in the park. As you might expect, it's also hard to find a parking spot in the Devil's Garden. If you find a spot, take the easy hike to the largest natural rock span in the world. The trail is sandy, and on hot days the trip can be tiring. So it's always a good idea to bring plenty of water. Soon, there's a view of fins in the distance. About a mile in, the trail forks to the left and you can see the largest natural rock span in the world, Landscape Arch. In the afternoon, it's in shadow, but in the morning, it's lit. From base to base, it's 306 feet across, and no, you're not allowed to walk across it. Many years ago, a man died trying. 
Beyond landscape arch, there are many more arches along the trail. At about the three mile point, you get the chance to walk on top of a fin. It's a pretty unique experience. If you plan your trip very well, you can do all of the things described in this segment in a day to a day and a half. Although weather and crowds may force you to improvise. But no matter what you do, I'll bet that arches will be one of the highlights of your Grand Circle trip. For those of you interested in photography, here's a review of my favorite photo ops in the park. In addition to a good camera and tripod, you should also have an app on your phone that tells you where the sun will be at any time, anywhere. I use Helios for the iPhone. You should scout your locations on the phone before you start your trip. Around noon, most of the wall is in the sun. And in late afternoon, the good light will be hitting the largest wall. And that's when this shot was taken. At Balanced Rock, there are times in the morning when it can be backlit, so it's safer to shoot in the afternoon. The Snowpack LaSalle Mountains will also be lit in the afternoon. As we said, it's best to shoot the back side of the north window just after sunrise. But the side facing the parking lot looks great in the afternoon. Often tour groups of up to 20 people are here well before sunrise, leaving no room for many who want to get to this spot. This shot was taken near the windows. All I did was turn around and point the lens towards Double Arch. The main park road looks great in the late morning to early evening when heading north into the park. Going in the other direction, it's backlit in the evening. The best light is also on the fiery furnace in the afternoon and evening. To capture landscape arch in the sun, you'll have to hike a mile or so in the morning. In the afternoon, it's backlit and it's even hard to see the arch. The best time to shoot delicate arch is at sunset. If the weather's nice, there will be a crowd, but there are plenty of good places to put your tripod. But still, it's best to be early. Again, remember to scout the location using a map or preferably a tool like Helios on the iPhone. It will tell you when and where the sun will rise and set. It'll really help you get a nice shot. Canyonlands is an immense wilderness of cliffs, mesas, and of course canyons. They were all shaped by the Colorado and Green Rivers into three separate land districts. They are all primitive, and there is no water available in the campgrounds. The districts are widely separated by fascinating and monumental natural features, so there are no roads that link them directly. The Needles District Visitor Center is about 80 miles southish of Moab. Hiking trails are the main attraction here. It's a place to hike in the middle of nowhere while being somewhere incredible. The Maze District is even more remote. It's at least 130 miles from Moab. The roads in the district are 4x4 only rough trails, and you'll need a great deal of self-reliance and skill to assure your survival if something goes wrong. The rivers are categorized as a separate water district. You could easily spend a couple of weeks exploring each district, but for our Grand Circle tour, we're going to spend our time exploring the most visited district, Island in the Sky. The Island in the Sky is, of course, a mesa that juts into the Canyonlands. It's only 30 miles or 45 minutes from Moab. The road rises 1,800 feet to the top of the Island in the Sky, which is about 6,000 feet above sea level. It isn't quite an island, a narrow 42-foot strip of land connects it to the main mesa. This sliver of a connection is called the neck. But the road is well designed and while driving, you won't have a clue that you're only a few feet from a thousand foot drop. Sheer cliffs at the edge of the mesa provide spectacular views at several viewpoints. This is the Green River Overlook. About 1,200 feet below is a broad shelf, technically called a bench. It's made of a much harder sandstone than the darker formations above. Near the cliff edge, the light rock almost looks like a beach. And millions of years ago, it was. Clearly, the local climate has changed quite a bit since then. In part because 150 million years ago, this tectonic plate was much farther south. Back then, this was a flat plain. But five to 10 million years ago, the Colorado Plateau began to rise. 
allowing the rivers to shape the landscape into something that is quite interesting. It's a harsh place, and it's not surprising that this was one of the last places in the continental U.S. to be explored and mapped. At the end of the Island Mesa, the viewpoint is appropriately called Grand View. On a clear day, you can see almost 100 miles in almost any direction. That thin line is a 100 plus mile 4x4 only path called the White Rim Road. Some of the surface scars are old mining roads cut during the 1940s and 50s to aid the search of uranium. We're looking south and a few miles from here, the two fairly calm rivers combine into a fast moving Colorado River. You can hike to the confluence from the Needles District. A few miles south of the confluence, there's a 14 mile long section called Cataract Canyon. It's remote enough that only multi-day rafting trips can go through its class five rapids. In 1869, John Wesley Powell and his team were the first white men to go down the river, and they did it in wooden boats. Near the Grand View Overlook is the Orange Cliffs Overlook, providing a great view to the west. Off in the distance, you're looking at the Maze District. This is a great spot to watch the sunset. Another great spot to catch sunset is Holman Spring Overlook. It's on the road to the Upheaval Dome. It faces southwest. When the clouds cooperate, it's almost magical. If you've been paying attention, you know that uplift has played a prominent role in shaping this park. There's one place in the park where this process is quite visible. A one mile round trip trail leads to the Upheaval Dome. In the rest of the park, there is geologic order. Old rocks are on the bottom and newer ones are on top. There is little folding of the rock layers indicating that for millions of years, the region has been pretty stable. The upheaval dome is quite different. It's about three miles across, and it's a place of dramatic disorder. In the center, the rocks are tilted almost vertically. It's being forced up and therefore bending the formations above it. The formations we see shouldn't be here. They belong several thousand feet below. Some process push them up here. And from above, the dome looks like an impact crater from a meteorite. Some geologists think that roughly 60 million years ago, a meteor with a diameter of approximately one-third of a mile hit this spot. Even in this scientific age, nobody knows which theory is correct. Canyonlands is known for its spectacular, immense views of distant landscapes. But with the signature view in Island of the Sky, there's a twist. This is Mesa Arch. It's just a quarter mile from the main road. On a cloudy afternoon, it may not look that special, but at sunrise, it's stunning. Hundreds of people often gather around this spot well before sunrise, and they're all trying to squeeze into the same little spot, so there's lots of spillover. Most are here with the goal of getting a shot like this, or this, or if you have sharp elbows, you may even get a shot like this. The odd crowd is very international. It's sad that few Americans take the time to see this wonderful place. An hour or so after sunrise, the crowds are gone, and this becomes one of the rare places with the sound of silence. You can hear yourself blink here. The views of Canyonlands are evocative. They draw you into the landscape, and there's a place where you can do just that. This is the Schaefer Trail viewpoint. 100 years ago, the Schaefer brothers used the canyon walls as a natural corral. They built the first trail up this 1,200-foot cliff to get their cattle to market. Today, it's a popular SUV trail, and we're about to take it all the way down to the Colorado River and back to Moab. Moab, Utah is an outdoor lover's paradise. It's the home of Arches National Park and Canyonlands National Park, where there's river rafting, rock climbing, hiking, and mountain biking. When you need an easy day, there's great photography, history, and even nice restaurants and some nightlife. You can even have an off-road adventure in your own car. This is the Schaefer Trail, 
as seen from the neck in the Island of the Sky District of Canyonlands. The first drop descends about 1,100 feet in a series of switchbacks. And believe it or not, you can safely drive it in your own SUV. And that's just what we're about to do. To get there, take Highway 313 towards the Canyonland entrance. The trailhead is a couple of miles before the Island in the Sky Visitor Center. When the pavement ends, the road is still flat, as if to give you more time to get used to driving on the loose, sandy surface. Then there's an impressive overlook, just before the trail cuts into the cliff face. We recorded nearly the entire one and a half hour drive. And in order to show you as much of it as possible, I've sped up most of the driving footage. I did the trail a few years ago, and this time I didn't stop as often. I know it can look scary, but the road is surprisingly wide. It's even safe to pass. The first time I remember being, well, not really scared, let's call it intimidated. The drop off off the driver's window is about 1100 feet, and it's very steep. But this time, before starting out, I did what is recommended. I checked on the trail's condition with the ranger at the visitor center. I learned that because the trail is so popular, the top portion is graded more often than it was in the past. The ranger actually said that the steep switchback section was the easiest part of the trip. I also grabbed a map. The dirt trail is 17 miles long. About halfway through, it changes names to the Potash Road. At the river, the trail joins the paved Highway 279 for several miles back to Moab. From the trailhead at 5,920 feet above sea level, we'll drop about 1,900 feet before getting back to Moab. The trail drops gradually, and the special low-range descend gear of the SUV did enough to help me avoid overheating the brakes. On my first trip, I warped the front rotors. Most of the ride is uneventful. You can hardly tell that you're descending until you get to a switchback. By the way, if you don't want to put wear and tear on your own vehicle, you can rent a 4x4 Jeep in Moab. This was originally a cattle trail. Local ranchers called the Schaefer Brothers built it about 100 years ago to get their cattle to market. It was expanded greatly in the 1940s when it was used by uranium prospectors. That's also when many of the roads on the canyon floor were cut. Many of these still scar the landscape. By the 50s, the Schaefer Trail was nearly forgotten. Like the rest of the area, it became a part of the National Park in 1964. The trail became popular only recently. In 1980, only 57,000 people visited all of Canyonlands. Today, nearly a million come every year. Though the view is amazing, the drive is remarkably normal. There's never an uh-oh moment or even a slight slip of the wheels. After about 10 minutes, the initial ascent is about over. It was almost too quick, though I never got over 15 miles an hour. Here's what I said about it at the time. Well, that was it. That was pretty easy. We dropped 11 to 1,200 feet uh, in about 15 minutes at the most, it looks like. Didn't get a chance to look at the view. Basically, I'm looking at the road about 15 to 20 feet in front of me. It's pretty darn interesting, let me tell you. Thoroughly enjoying it. Mountain bikers from around the world come to Moab, and some even try to pedal up this road. As a cyclist myself, I ask if the rider needs food or water. It's over 90 degrees, and sometimes they just might need it. There are several connecting trails in the canyon. The longest is the White Rim Road. It's over 100 miles long, winding its way across the Caprock, often just a few feet from the canyons that are cut by the Colorado and Green Rivers, which are hundreds of feet below. The White Rim Road can be seen from many of Canyonland's viewpoints. Here it is from the Green River Overlook. There are few signs on the trail, but they do helpfully exist at this T intersection. The road ahead is the White Rim. The Schaefer Trail goes to the left. The ranger I talked to said the White Rim Trail was safe for two-wheel drive vehicles like mine, up to Muscle Man Arch, whatever that is. He says you'll know it when you see it. Well, I decided to go exploring. Oddly, the White Rim rises slightly. This took a toll on a couple of cyclists. These were a part of a tour group with a support vehicle. Because I hadn't studied this part of the map, I was expecting the trail to be near the rim. It wasn't. 
and it became sandier. This is not a place to get stuck. The trail info sheet states that it's best to take enough food and water for a day or two in case you break down and have to be rescued. It also claims that towing charges could easily reach $1,000. At a wide spot in the road, next to the cyclist support vehicle, I decided to head back. I learned later that Muscle Man Arch was a further 40 minutes down the road. A mile or so later, I rejoined the Schaefer Trail. A wooden sign claims that it's 32 miles to Moab via the Potash Road. I've traveled about eight miles so far, so the trail map, well, it's a bit misleading. A few hundred yards later, it starts to get rough. The path narrows and gets very rough as you descend into Schaefer Canyon. It's here that you realize why you need a high clearance vehicle. Going slow and dodging the largest of the sharp rocks is critical. It becomes evident that the ranger was right. The top section is the easy part. Then there's a fairly flat clearing with nice views. This is a great spot to take your time or even stop to enjoy the scenery. It gets rough again as you cross a wash. During a rain, this part can be treacherous or even impassable. The drive up is also a challenge. These motorcyclists asked me about the part I just drove down, and they shared what was next for me. The trail is now on a broad shelf above the Colorado River. The cliffs rise 12 to 1500 feet, and the view is amazing. It took 45 minutes to get here, including the White Rim excursion. From Dead Horse Point, high above, you can see this part of the road. This is the only overlook on the river, so it's worth spending some time exploring it and taking it all in. When Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, he described what he saw as magnificent desolation. I can think of no better way to describe this spot. It makes the rough ride well worth the effort. In the other direction, in the layers, you see millions of years of geology and earth history. A little farther down the road, a faded spur trail heads to the right and provides another view of the river. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I saw the spur trail from Dead Horse Point State Park the next day. Now that you know it's here, you should take it. From Dead Horse Point, you can see the next few miles of the road and a few more spur trails. By this time, the trail has changed names. It's now called the Potash Road and a portion of the White Rim Road. The road meanders for several miles. By the way, we're no longer in Canyonlands National Park. In fact, we haven't been since just before the River Overlook. On some maps, the road even has a number. It's called County Road 142. When the landscape opens up, again, you get that feeling of magnificent desolation. It's another good spot to stop and take a few pictures. As you go over a crest, there's a brief hint of blue on the horizon. They are potash evaporation pools from a mining operation. They provide a few of the non-tourism related jobs in Moab. They also provide nice contrast to the landscape. The road ends down at river level, so there are still several hundred feet to drop. And drop it does. It was too rough for the stabilization system, so sorry for the bumps. There are other trails down here, and there are no signs, so it's easy to get a bit lost, especially when heading in the other direction. Telephone poles are a sign that it's almost over. There are only a few miles of dirt road left. 
there's one more interesting photo op just before leaving the dirt. This balanced rock is about the size of a small bungalow. When you hit the pavement, you're on Highway 279. It starts just after the boat dock on the Colorado River. Suddenly, there's more greenery along the road. The Colorado is just to the right. Then there are great sandstone cliffs. This area is called Wall Street. Look for a sign pointing to Indian writing. Several feet above the road, in the dark desert varnish, the ancients left their mark. Most depict animals and those who hunted them. You may be wondering why they're so high off the ground. Well, the natural level of the dirt was below the area of the desert varnish. The dirt was removed when they built Highway 279. A little further down the road is the rock climbing area. This is the easy section where local outfitters train first timers to climb these nearly vertical walls. It seems fitting to end a journey that began by descending a cliff by watching someone climb one. There are just a few more miles back to Moab and this will give you plenty of time to reflect. In just a couple of hours, you've descended over 1,900 feet on a road that was carved into a cliff. You've spent time in a harsh, pristine, former ranch with 1,200 foot tall stone walls that were once used as a natural corral. You've seen how resources are mined. You've seen ancient writing. And you've seen how some cheat gravity. All in all, not a bad way to spend an hour and a half to three hours. Most Moab visitors just go to the national parks. But those who really know the area also go to Dead Horse Point State Park, and they take a drive up scenic Route 128, at least as far as the Fisher Towers. To get to Dead Horse Point, head towards Canyonlands. They share Highway 313, take the first left, and continue until the road ends. Dead Horse Point State Park is at the end of a several mile long butte that juts into and above Canyonlands. It has the only campground in the area with running water, and at the end of the road is one of my favorite viewpoints, not just of Canyonlands, but of anywhere. The lookout is almost 2,000 feet above the Green River. The island in the sky and Mesa Arch are just to the southwest, near the horizon. The dirt road below is the Schaefer Trail. It starts in the island in the sky, the gravel continues on for 17 miles until it reaches the Colorado River. To the east, there's a view of snow-capped mountains. Also to the east, you see the colorful evaporation ponds from a potash mining business. On a clear, still morning, Dead Horse Point is another place with the sounds of silence. On a clear day, the view stretches out nearly 100 miles in almost any direction. Because of the harsh climate and rugged landscape, it should be no surprise that this was one of the last places in the continental US to be explored and mapped. This is a favorite place for photographers, and many get there pretty early. One group told me they got here at about 4 a.m. to capture the Milky Way galaxy as it rose to the southwest. But the best light to shoot the canyons is a little after sunrise. Photo tour leaders know this, and there are often crowds of shutterbugs clinging to the cliffs. In the afternoon, the light isn't quite as dramatic, but Dead Horse Point is always a great place to be. Back in the olden days, our folks used to take us on long scenic drives. Just for the fun of it, a few miles north of the Moab Town Center is a great road to help carry on that tradition. It's called Highway 128. National Geographic calls it spectacular. The road esses its way along the Green River for almost 26 miles. A paved bike trail runs between the river and the road near Moab. The closest city to Moab with a commercial airport is Grand Junction, Colorado. This is the scenic way to get there. The landscape gets wider past Red Cliffs Lodge and Resort. This is a great place to float or paddle down the Colorado River. Many of the flat areas next to the river are used for cultivation, with the help of irrigation from the river. 
There are many intersecting dirt roads past about mile marker 17. Hollywood loves these roads, and the area has appeared in film since the 1940s. One road leads to the Professor Valley, which was used in City Slickers 2, Austin Powers, and many other films. Near mile marker 21, there's a small sign pointing east to the Fisher Towers. They were named after an 1880s pioneer. This is a federal recreation area with a small campground, pit toilet, and no water source. There are a number of hiking trails, but the main activity is rock climbing. These towers are well known. They were featured in a TV commercial for a bank back in 2011. But rock climbers have been coming here since the early 1960s. There are small spires to learn on, and there are much bigger ones for the highly skilled. Another 11 miles northish on Highway 128, there's another old landmark. Pull over just after crossing the bridge. Believe it or not, this relic is the remnant of what was the longest suspension bridge in Utah until April 2008, when it was destroyed by a grass fire started by a small boy who was playing with matches. The Dewey Bridge was built in 1916. It had a 500 foot long wooden driving surface that was only eight feet wide. More recently, it was used as a bike trail. Highway 128 continues for another 20 miles to Interstate 70. This is a great way to spend a relaxing evening. So when in Moab, remember there's more to do than just see the national parks. Sure, they're great, but Dead Horse Point and Highway 128, as well as some other places along the way that I'll leave you to find on your own, are all well worth exploring. It's now time to start our journey to the westernmost part of the circle, Bryce Canyon National Park. Luckily, the Goblin Valley and Capitol Reef National Park are on the way. Once again, to get there, we're going to spend some time looking out of the window. But there's always something interesting to see. While you're driving, just think of it as the world's largest IMAX screen. From Canyonlands, it's 205 magnificent miles to Capitol Reef National Park. If the sky is clear from I-70, we'd be looking at the nearly 100 mile long ridge called the Water Pocket Fold. It's the home to Capitol Reef National Park. Unfortunately, because of the weather, we could only see a dark bump on the horizon. After just 32 miles on the interstate, we turn southwest onto State Highway 24. We're driving near the edge of a large sandstone area that stretches all the way back to Canyonlands. In a few places, we get our first look of the small, odd-shaped pinnacles of rock called hoodoos. By the way, this is also how you get to the 4x4 only roads of the Mays District of Canyonlands. 96 miles from Moab, we take a 12-mile side road to a very weird place. This is Goblin Valley State Park. Here, layers of siltstone, sandstone, and other sedimentary rock are eroding at different rates leaving oddly amusing structures that remind some of goblins. To others, they look more like mushrooms. To learn more about how they form, check with the visitor center. Even on this gray, drizzly day, it was fun exploring the weirdness. There are no trails or even a set route, so you're free to just wander. When you're down in the valley, the goblins take on a more surreal appearance. The movie Galaxy Quest was shot here, because it looks so much like an alien planet. On the far wall of the valley, you can see the slow erosional process in motion. It looks like the stone is slowly dripping away, about an hour to explore it, but many spend a few days here. There is a small campground, but reservations are recommended. On this day, though we arrived early, no camping spaces were available. A few miles south of the Goblins, the highway turns to follow the Fremont River up the fold. It's technically called a monocline, and it's an incredibly large step up of the Earth's crust. 50 to 70 million years ago, rock layers on top of the fold rose 7,000 feet higher than the same layers to the east. If you like geology, the drive itself is worth the trip. This was shot in May, and even in the desert, showers brought many flowers. Capitol Reef is at the top of the fold, in a mostly flat valley that has attracted humans for at least 12,000 years. 
Eight to 1200 years ago, some of these left their mark. Just before you get to the visitor center, there's a huge petroglyph panel on a sandstone cliff face. Most of the figures resemble humans, though some say they look like men from outer space. As always, stop at the visitor center to see if there's anything special going on in the park. It turns out we just missed a blacksmith demonstration in the village historic shop. Exploring the landscape can help you understand how the place got its name. Back in the day, some thought this white rock looked somewhat like the U.S. Capitol building. And a ranger told me that the fold was quite an obstacle to cross for pioneers 100 years ago. And at the time, the word for a large barrier was reef. And that's how we got the name Capitol Reef. It has nothing to do with an ancient sea. White men first settled the area in the 1880s. The first Mormon settlers planted an orchard, and it's still producing fruit. And they called their settlement Frutia. For photographers, there's more to shoot here than just rocks. There's also a photogenic barn near the town site. The barn and the campground occupy much of the park's level ground. Capitol Reef is really about exploring the backcountry. Several of its dirt roads can be used by passenger cars. However, some are 4x4 only trails. This is one of the park's most visited trails. It's the road to Grand Wash. It's worth stopping along the way, and especially at this junction, where you'll find an old uranium mine from the early 1900s. Here a miner purified a radioactive powder, and he sold it as a supposedly healthy food supplement. Well, it wasn't. This is a great way to see the canyon. In most cases, you're looking down on a canyon from a high ridge. Here, you're driving through one. And by the way, until World War II, this area was very difficult to get to. You needed a horse and buggy. The first motorized tractor didn't get here until the 1940s. And Highway 24 wasn't paved until 1962. And the walls are full of small holes or pockets. Water collects in these pockets, and that's how the 100 mile long ridge got its name the water pocket fold. After driving a few hours on gravel roads, it's time to get back on the road and head to Bryce. Instead of taking the 100 mile long 4x4 only Brim Trail, we took the scenic byway, Highway 12. It's only 85 miles from Capitol Reef to Bryce National Park, but you may be compelled to make one more stop before you get there. Highway 12 is a twisty mountain road at Boulder Pass, it reaches 9,600 feet. Then the road twists along the top of petrified sand dunes, called Hell's Backbone. There's a great view of it at a pullout called Boynton Overlook. It provides a great view of an ancient Sahara-like desert that somehow has been turned to stone. It's hard to find words to describe Bryce Canyon. Colorful is one, bizarre might be another. But the best is, well, you just have to see the place for yourself. It lies on the top step of the Grand Staircase, where loose rock is easily washed away by rain and 200 freeze and thaw cycles per year. The result is tall spires, called hoodoos. Bryce is at a higher elevation than the parks on the east side of the circle. The park road is between 8,000 and 9,000 feet up, and the temperatures are much cooler. On this day in early May, the morning temperature was 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Eight inches of snow fell a few days earlier. The elevation and very clean air make this a great place for stargazing. You can see three times as many stars here as you can in most places in the U.S. The park has star watching parties on a regular basis, and photographing stars is difficult and, well, it's a skill I haven't quite mastered. It's not a large park and most viewpoints are just off the main road. The canyon, well, it isn't technically a canyon. Geologists call these theaters. They mostly open up to the east-northeast, so there's very few places where the sun hits the hoodoos. This is the view from Rainbow Point. Because the air is so clear here, on most days you can see well over 90 miles. And on very clear days, like this one, you can see up to 200 miles to the horizon. Before the Industrial Revolution, this is how most people saw the world. Every few miles, there's a pullout to another viewpoint. This feature is called Natural Bridge. Well, it, it's not actually a bridge. Natural bridges are eroded by rivers. Frost and rain washed away the soft, iron-rich soil of the Clarion Formation, making this an arch. Erosion here occurs at a rapid rate, 
This tree is about 100 years old, and when it was young, its roots were covered with soil. So in less than 100 years, more than a foot of soil has been washed away. There are three climatic zones in the park and a wide variety of wildlife, like this small bird. If you're luckier than me, well, you may even see one of the rare and much larger California condor that live in the area. There are several trails in the park, and most are short enough that anyone with proper hiking boots should take at least one. I decided to take the Navajo Loop, starting from Sunset Point. The trail is only 1.3 miles long, and it quickly drops 550 feet to the canyon floor, where it connects to several other trails. Sunny parts of the trail were dry, but shaded areas were sticky and muddy. And I soon learned why the rangers at the visitor center were so concerned about the type of boots I was wearing. They highly recommended that only boots with big lugs be worn. I'm glad that that's what I had because it really was quite slick. After the tunnel, the trail was covered with snow and ice. As you descend, the size of the hoodoos become apparent. Now, forgive the shaky camera work here, but the trail gets very narrow and the tripod would barely fit through the narrow opening. I was also a bit distracted, wondering how that ponderosa pine got there, and how was it able to grow so tall in such a confined space? On the valley floor, it's pretty obvious that we're in a different climate zone. Not only has it opened up, but there's a surprising number of trees down here, and there are several miles of trails, so I decided to take one. It's hard to remember that you're about 7,500 feet above sea level until you look at the sky. It's a deeper shade of blue up here. The occasional clearing provides a view of the 500-foot cliff I just walked down. Eventually, it's time to start the muddy climb back up. The mud was not only slick, but it also built up on the boots and made them heavy. So going up the equivalent of a 50-story high-rise in muddy boots doesn't make the journey any easier. The tripod quickly doubled as a hiking pole. It made the hike up the hill much easier. The trail is close to the canyon walls, and they almost look like they're melting. In a way, they are. Each time it rains or snows, a little bit of the rock exfoliates and drips off the walls. The good news is the higher you go, the better the view. The last couple of switchbacks are long sweepers, above most of the hoodoos, providing a great view of the most famous one in the park, Thor's Hammer. At the top, at Sunrise Point, there's a nice view of the valley. There's a very nice view of the valley. There are several other trails in the park, but if you're looking for a moderate hike that gets you into the hoodoos, I recommend the Navajo Loop. The western portion of the Grand Circle is characterized by odd terrain on a smaller scale than what we find in the Four Corners and in the Moab area. It's easier to feel more connected to the landscape when you can walk amongst the mushrooms and goblins that are only a few feet above your head. It's also easier to see erosional forces at work here. In the Four Corners, everything is huge and seemingly permanent. Here, you witness the effects of weather and time, giving many a better sense of how their actions shape the environment. Most Grand Circle tours include a trip to nearby Zion National Park. It's a great place to go. It really deserves to be explored for several days, and we just didn't have the time. So we're off to Lake Powell and Page, Arizona. If you're in the mood for a side trip, or if the Bryce campground is full, check out Kodachrome Basin State Park. Its red rock is less than 30 miles from the Bryce entrance. In the early days of color photography, Kodachrome slide film was the best way to capture the vibrant colors of the rock, so the state of Utah named the park after the film. There are plenty of hiking trails here, and in the summer, trail rides and other activities are available. The road to Kodachrome Basin has many photo opportunities. The landscape is rugged, and there's no shortage of photogenic old farmhouses and outbuildings. Here's another travel option. 
If for whatever reason you're not interested in going to Bryce, perhaps because there's snow in the pass on Highway 12, or if you need to cut your trip short, there's a shortcut from the Goblin Valley back to the Four Corners. And there's plenty of nice stops along the way. From the Goblin Valley, it's only about 90 minutes to Natural Bridges National Monument. In the Visitor Center, you learn that in 1883, a prospector who was looking for gold near the Colorado River, he didn't find any gold, but what he found was three large bridges made of stone. Today, they're the main features of Natural Bridges National Monument. It's here that I learned the difference between an arch and a bridge. Bridges are formed by streams and rivers. Arches are eroded from the side due to wind and frost and other types of erosion. On this May Day, the weather was cold. It even started to sleet, which made it difficult to even see the bridges. If you look carefully, you can see the top of one. It takes less than an hour to drive the Parks Loop Road to each of the three bridges. The next 70 miles to the now familiar Mexican hat feature a couple of more trees. A few miles from the monument, head south on Highway 261. You'll pass the extreme east end of Lake Powell, which is formed by the controversial Glen Canyon Dam across the Colorado River in Page, Arizona. The lake is about 100 feet lower than it used to be due to several years of low rain and snowfall. About 10 miles from Mexican Hat, there's another tree. It's an old mining road called the Moki Dugway. The signs approaching it are rather intimidating. On a clear day, the view might be fantastic. On a rainy one, you just see the potential. By this time, the sleet had turned to rain. So I continued even though the pavement doesn't. In three miles, the well-graded switchbacks drop 1,100 feet from the top of Cedar Mesa. By the way, the state of Utah recommends that vehicles and RVs longer than 28 feet not attempt to negotiate this steep 10% grade. The gravel was relatively smooth, and there was never an out-of-control moment. And on the way down, there's more good news. The cell phone started working. We had zero bars for quite some time. When the road levels out, you're driving through the Valley of the Gods. It's a smaller version of nearby Monument Valley. A dirt road meanders through it, and on a clear day, it's well worth the trip. And to the east, we can now see the familiar site of Rapley Ridge in Mexican Hat, indicating that we're back in the Four Corners. The route from Bryce to Page, Arizona, follows the National Park Highway, better known as U.S. Highway 89. It runs from Flagstaff, Arizona, through the Rocky Mountains, all the way to Canada. It passes through seven national parks along the way. Each of our 156 miles is designated as a scenic byway. For most of the route, we're driving through the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, covering much of southwestern Utah. A less direct route to Page takes you down an old gravel road called the Cottonwood Road. It leads to the amazing 150-foot-tall Grosvenor Arch, the largest of which has a nearly 100-foot span. Yet another travel option will take you to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, but due to snow-covered roads, access is often limited to the summer months. One of the most amazing places in the Grand Staircase is called The Wave. It's near the Utah-Arizona border. You get there via a beat-up old dirt road that is assuming you have permission to go there. In an effort to protect the area, only 20 people are allowed in each day. 10 are selected from an online lottery, and 10 names are literally pulled from a hat each morning at the BLM office in Kanab, Utah. In the high season, over 100 people will be trying to crowd into the tiny office each day. I've thrown my name into the hat several times, but my name has never been drawn. They don't give you exact directions to the trailhead until you've earned your pass, but I do know the road follows this escarpment. Then there's a two and a half mile hike to the wave. These images were supplied by a German couple who were lucky enough to be selected three times in five days. The views are incredible. 
and I'll keep entering the online lottery. One day, I hope I'll be able to see this for myself. Lake Powell is an Lake incredible, Powell oasis, is an incredible in oasis in the it's desert. It's about 186 miles long. It's 186 miles long. It has long. over 2,000 miles, miles of shoreline. 2,000 miles of shoreline. The lake is formed by the Colorado the lake River. Straddles the Utah, and it Arizona straddles border. the Arizona Utah most border. Most of it's in Utah, but most of it is in Utah. The Glen Canyon Dam is in Page, The Glen Canyon Arizona. Dam is in Page, Arizona. The primary Arizona. purpose of the dam is its primary flood purpose control, is flood water control, storage, water storage, and to provide and clean power, power, clean to, power millions. to millions. Oddly, one of the dirtiest coal-burning plants, coal burning plants in the country sits on Native American, Native American land, land just a few miles, just a few away. miles away. The top of the white line the is top the of the lighter rock is the high water from mark from the early 1980s. Today, the lake level is Today, over, 100, lake is over 100 feet lower. The lake draws two but million it still visitors draws a over year. two million visitors most of them a year. Will stay in page. Most of them will stay in page. I've decided not to play in the water and instead headed to a couple of great photo spots. A must stop for any photographer a visiting must page. For any photographer is a tour is to, a tour lower, to Antelope lower Antelope Canyon. Canyon. Tickets at the site Tickets can, be, the purchased site can be purchased from in page several from several tour from several tour providers. You'll ride to the canyon, in, to the canyon in an open truck. After a short drive, after a short drive, you'll see amazing, you'll see amazing things thing in this, in this most slot famous canyon. slot canyon. I've been here several times. I've been here several and times. Each time, it's a and little time it's a little different because each rain causes because further each rain erosion. Because causes further erosion. In the high season, which is in the from high late spring to fall, you won't be alone. You won't be alone. My last visit in May. In May, according to my watch, every every three minutes, a new truckload of tourists entered the canyon. It takes about 30 minutes. It takes to about 30 through. minutes to wander and through. You get a few minutes. You get a few minutes in each gallery. section or gallery. And most guides explain the history. Most of the guides place know where the best camera gallery. spots are. At noon, it's At possible, about to, noon, capture it's possible to capture a beam of light, beam of light passing through a small passing hole. Through a small hole. The to get this know shot, photographers are interested in getting guide office when the lights know that photographers are interested in capturing this shot. Our second great photo spot is just south of Page on Highway 89. This is the trailhead to Horseshoe Bend. It's only about a half mile long, but it's uphill and in places rather sandy. But the view is well worth the effort. As always seems to be the case, the river, in this case the Colorado River, is about a thousand feet below. If you look carefully, you can see a tour boat. It gives some scale to the enormous canyon. It's now time to head back to the Four Corners, and there are several ways to get there, though none of them are a straight shot. The shortest way uses highways 98 and 160, it's 250 or so miles from Page to our last stop, Mesa Verde National Park. Other routes are over twice as long, and they take you to other amazing places, such as the best preserved meteor crater on Earth. You can drive on old Route 66, and then explore Petrified Forest National Park. Then there's the opportunity to tour three of the largest sites of pre-Columbian Native American communities. This is the best preserved meteor crater in the world. It's just a few miles south of I-40. 50,000 years ago, a several thousand ton meteor created a 4,100 foot diameter and 570 foot deep crater. The Crater and Visitor Center is privately owned and well worth the visit. Before there were interstates, there was Route 66. It was a collection of roads that carried millions of travelers from Chicago to Los Angeles from the 1920s through the 1980s. Towns along the way came up with creative and often odd ways to get drivers to stop and spend money in their shops. Route 66 was decommissioned in 1985, but many of its landmarks remain. In Illinois, a water tower was turned into the world's largest ketchup bottle. In Missouri, there's the world's largest rocking chair. Most motels along the route had elaborate neon signs, and some were theme-based. These are the remains of John's modern cabins. Even in the 1950s, there was nothing modern about them. The less than modern outhouse was out back. One of the best preserved stretches of old Route 66 is nearly on our way. It's in Holbrook, Arizona. It's near Petrified Forest National Park. Here, dinosaurs decorate rock shops and large signs help businesses earn a living for their owners. You can even spend a night in one of the old theme style motels, like this one. Each room is a private wigwam, sort of. And in the parking lot, you'll be surrounded by vintage cars. By the way, I've stayed in many of these classic Route 66 motels. And even the $25 a night ones are pretty nice and clean. Petrified Forest National Park is just a few miles down the road. This is a small park with one main road and several short walking trails. At the visitor center, you learn that most of the best petrified wood was pillaged 100 years ago, 
and the park was formed to protect what remained. 225 million years ago, this area was a forest on a vast floodplain near the equator. Some of the trees died and fell into a swamp, and then they were quickly covered up by mineral-rich sediment. Over time, the minerals were absorbed in the wood. Eventually, they replaced the wood while preserving its structure. It took millions of years, but recent uplift and erosional forces have revealed these fossilized trees. Humans have been in the area for at least 12,000 years. Many left their mark here on newspaper rock. At the north end of the park, near I-40, there's an elevated view of the 160-mile-long crescent-shaped parcel of desert called the Painted Desert. It runs from near the Grand Canyon to just east of this spot. Route 66 used to pass by here. Many drivers were trying to make it all the way to California. This car didn't quite make it. Highway 191 heads up to the Four Corners. At about the halfway point, a side road leads to Canyon de Chelly National Monument. It's spelled Chelly, but trust me, it's de Chelly. It's the first of the three large ancient communities we'll visit. For 5,000 years, this was a major community. No one knows exactly why, but it was vacated by about the year 1300. If you have the time, take a Jeep tour or hike to its most famous ruin, called the White House. I was told it would be in the sunlight in the morning, so that's when I hiked the two-mile one-way trail. When I got there, I was impressed by the structure, but the ruin was in shadow, making it less than a spectacular photo. It also made the couple of hundred foot climb out of the canyon less fun. 85 miles to the east, as the crow flies, is the area's largest pre-Columbian ruin, Chaco Canyon. Unfortunately, it's 200 miles by car. At about the halfway point, a slight detour leads to the only place in the U.S. where you can be in four states at the same time. I've only been there once, and it was closed at the time. The location is controlled by the Navajo, and there's a slight fee. In 2010, they updated the site, but there are still few amenities. For example, there's still no power. We have to drive another 100 miles to the southeast to get to Chaco Canyon National Historic Monument. This was the hub of the ancient culture. All roads led to Chaco. Today, only two heavily washboarded dirt roads lead to it. But if you're a fan of native cultures, this is a must-see. Its largest structure is Pueblo Benito. It's not just the largest here. It's the largest pre-Columbian stone structure north of Mexico. In the mid-1200s, it had four stories and over 600 rooms and 50 round ceremonial kivas, proving that the Chacoans were excellent masons. To see more of this National Historic Monument, see the extra section. Chaco Canyon and Canyon de Chez aren't popular enough yet to be designated as national parks. Our last stop is. This is Mesa Verde National Park. It's about 70 miles from Durango. Unlike Chaco, Mesa Verde has luxuriously paved roads. In the early 2000s, lightning strikes caused many fires. The fires burned over 20,000 acres. Blackened forests may not be nice to look at, but the fires do have benefits. For example, they revealed many never before seen archeological sites. There's 600 cliff dwellings here. They seem to be everywhere you look. Most are on either side of a long, steep-sided canyon. In some cases, hand and footholds had to be carved into the cliff face. Even today, you'll need to be fairly physically fit to walk among the most popular ruins. In many cases, you need to be on a ranger-led tour just to visit them. Tour tickets can be purchased in the visitor center or online. The fee is small and the tours sell out quickly, so it's best to get your tickets a day or so in advance. This is especially true if you want to go on the slightly more expensive twilight tour of Cliff Palace. This is the Cliff Palace trailhead. At first, there's a steep drop. Then you have to scale a ladder. And this is the Cliff Palace. It has about 150 rooms and 23 below ground ceremonial kivas. It's estimated that about 100 could stay here. This must have been an important place. 75% of the 600 cliff dwellings in the park have only one to five rooms each. The ranger told us that it's believed that most of the structures were used to store grain, and it's thought that Cliff Palace was a social and administrative site that was frequently used for ceremonies. The ranger talk was informative, and he answered all questions. The tour is only about 45 minutes long, but it can be hot, so it's a good idea to bring some water. You can drive the loop road 
and stop along the way to look at the sights at the well-marked viewpoints, as well as take a tour in the same day. I stayed for a weekend, and there's still much more I'd like to see and do. I spent the weekend in the park's lodge. Rooms fill up early, and you'll have to get reservations to secure a room. The rooms go into the woods, and these deer came right up to my room. By the way, we're at about 8,000 feet here. The official Mesa Verde National Park website is one of the best I've seen. It has lots of up-to-date information. There are great maps, and there's even a section on how to take great photos in the park. All of the places we visited on the Grand Circle have had helpful websites, and many were used to help plan this trip. But this one, the one at Mesa Verde, is really good. Well, we've closed the Grand Circle. Along the way, we've seen and explored amazing things, indeed the icons of the West. We've experienced the harshness of the weather and terrain, while gaining respect for those who first managed to survive and thrive here. We've traveled about 1,500 miles. I've appreciated every mile and every minute of it. But the West is big, and I've learned that there is much more I'd like to explore in this vast part of it. Well, this was my grand circle. I hope it's encouraged you to do some more research and to venture out on yours.